everyone, welcome to Politics in Plain English. My name is Justin Hibbard, and if you're new to Politics in Plain English, let me give you just a brief intro. I take complex political ideas, I break them down into ways that are easy to digest and understand, and I do it without all the spin and all the emotion, and just dealing with facts um, and data. And the purpose of this is that you become an informed voter, because I truly believe that an informed voter is the most powerful voter. Now, politics in plain English, we always begin with a question. And today's question is, why did Donald Trump lose the election? And before we get to that, I would love if you could do me a huge favor, and that's subscribe. You can subscribe to Politics in Plain English at your favorite podcast channel. You can, uh, I also do a video of this on YouTube, which you can find. Just search for Justin R. Hibbard, and that is actually what you can find, how you can find me on Twitter and Facebook. Just search for Justin R. Hibbard, and you can follow me there. And if you like what I have to say, I do a lot more writing than I do podcasting, and you can uh, subscribe to my article at Justin R. Hibbard. Dot substack dot com. Now, let's get back to our question. Why did Donald Trump lose the election? And before I answer that question, I just want to acknowledge something. I want to acknowledge that 74 million Americans voted for Donald Trump, uh, more than any other sitting president. That, that's a tremendous feat for him. And, uh, and I understand what it feels like to vote for someone and not have them win the election. And in fact, before this election, three the past three elections, um, my candidate of choice lost. So I get that disappointment. I understand. Uh, I also understand that there are people that feel very passionate about this. We're only a, a month out of the election, and they think that the, the election was stolen and that there was rampant fraud. Uh, I don't believe that's the case. Um, I'm not going to really get into those details in this podcast. Um, I, I think there's a lot of great information. If you look for primary sources, and by primary sources, I mean things like the court hearings, actually listening to the court cases, um, actually reading uh, the judge's response to these court cases, I think you'll find everything that you need to find right there. I'm not going to get into things like how the voting machines work or didn't work or anything like that. But I think what you'll find is when you listen to my explanation here as to why Donald Trump lost the election, I think you'll understand that Donald Trump got the votes that we would expect him to get. Okay, And so uh, that's one of the reasons I don't think that there was a widespread election because I think there's just there was just so much consistency that it, that it that kind of answers itself. But, um, but I just want to acknowledge those things first and to say that I'm not here to disparage on Donald Trump or rather even on his voters. Um, I'm here to just answer this question as matter of factly as I can because one of the things that I, I would be concerned about if I were a political advisor and I've worked on a couple of campaigns before is I would want to do things that got my boss elected and not do things that got my boss uh, that made my boss lose the election. And so that's how I'm approaching this. What lessons do we learn from this election and, and what lessons can politicians apply moving forward? Um, I think there's a lot of them and let's dive in with answering the question, why did Donald Trump lose the election? The answer to that question is Donald Trump lived in the 40s. And by that, I don't mean that Donald Trump uh, was the 45th president or that he was born in 1946. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I mean to say is that Donald Trump's approval rating was solidly in the 40% range. His lowest approval rating was 35%. His highest was 49%. So right there in that range, his average approval rating was 40%. Now let me say a couple of things about that. Number one, the highest of his highest approval rating was 49%. That is extremely low. In fact, it's the lowest of any president since we've been doing approval ratings by a long shot. Since Franklin D. Roosevelt, no one has gotten lower, and their high has not been lower than 66%. And that was Richard Nixon back in 1973. When you look at that, you say 49% to 66%, uh, that's, a, that's a big range. He was just not a very popular president. He was a popular president among his base, which I'll get to in just a second. But among the whole country, 49% is extremely low. His average approval rating was 40%, which is the lowest, again, of all of those presidents since Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1940s, late 1930s. Um, now, the other thing that I want to say about his approval rating is that it's extremely consistent. 
an extremely consistent approval rating. Let, let me put this in perspective. So Donald Trump's approval rating, his, his lowest was 35%, his highest was 49%. Um, let's compare that with a couple of others. Barack Obama, his highest was 67%, his lowest was 40%. George W. Bush, his highest was 90% after 9-11 and 25% leading up to the 2008 election during the Great Recession. His father was very similar, an 89% approval rating after the first Gulf War and a low of 29% leading up to the 1992 election, which he ended up losing uh, when the, the economy was slumping. So when you look and compare Donald Trump's 14-point swing to George W. Bush's 65-point swing, uh, you see just the stark difference. Donald Trump's approval rating was extremely consistent, and that is really weird and abnormal for a president. Presidents generally have these large swings as something, po you know, something they do is widely popular and something that's going on is widely unpopular, like the economy. Um, what does that say to me? Well, I, it says two things, and I want to get to both of these. The first thing, it says that Donald Trump really secured his base. If you would have told me leading up to the 2020 election, if you would have said like maybe five years ago, if you would have said, hey, there's going to be a president running for a re-election in 2020, uh, he's, what, what do you think is his approval rating is going to be? And let me give you the scenario. There's a, world, a global pandemic that's killed 250,000 American people. The stock market collapsed and lost a third of its value in that year. Unemployment is at a historic high. People are calling this you know, a second Great Depression and all sorts of civil unrests. I would say, uh, yeah, that president may get 15% of the vote, maybe. But Donald Trump got 47% of the vote, very similar to what he got in 2016. Uh, he got 74 million votes, more than any other sitting president. Uh, that, that's a record. Uh, that's crazy to me. But it's so consistent with his approval rating. His approval rating of 49%, that high, occurred in 2020 during the time of the pandemic. Leading up to the, the, the election, there were people parading, doing Trump car parades and waving Trump flags. I don't know that I've ever seen that. And what that says is that Donald Trump was a master at playing to his base. He got people excited about the direction the country was heading, heading in the time of a pandemic when a quarter of a million people had died. Uh, that that's that's crazy to me. I mean, I guess hats off to him. If we're going to look at at maybe some things that uh, the good things that a president could do, I I mean that seemed to be somewhat of an effective strategy, uh, except for one thing. Donald Trump did it by ostracizing over half the country. He has the highest disapproval rating at 60%. Um, he was a very polarizing figure. Uh, you either loved him or you hated him, and there were plenty of people that hated him. You know, there are lots of people that say, oh man, Donald Trump was great. He moved the embassy in, in Israel to Jerusalem and officially recognizes the capital. He pulled out of the Iran agreement. He dismantled Obamacare. He pulled out of the Paris Accord. He levied sanctions on China. I mean, he just kind of went in and, and said, ah, this is what we're going to do and we're going to get stuff done. And there were lots of people that did not agree with some or all of those things, including his ability to strong arm justices into the federal, conservative justices into the federal courts and the Supreme Court. That speaks to some people. It did not speak to everyone. And so while there was a strong base that supported him, there was a, a, a strong opposition that disapproved of him. Um, and so, yeah, Donald Trump was able to get a lot of voters out there, 74 million, um, but he also was able to fuel the other side to get people, more people, to go out and vote for Joe Biden. When you look at this election, there were more people that voted than ever before. We had, but still, only 66% of our eligible voters actually voted. And so, you know, it's not like we, there was 102 or 105 percent of the voting population suggesting rampant fraud. It was 66 percent of our voting population actually voted for this, but still more than any other election in history. Um, what's the takeaway here? 
Well, I, you know, as I look about the, as I look at this information, I think back on Donald Trump's presidency. I think this is a guy that Republicans wanted. They got exactly what they wanted. They wanted a, a, they they were tired of the Washington politics and the gridlock as usual, right? They wanted a Washington outsider. This is something they talked about forever and ever and ever. They wanted someone to come in there and forget about the the political norms, forget about all of the political correctness and go in there and just get stuff done. And that's what Donald Trump did. He ran this country like a CEO. He has no political background. He's not uh, he's not you know, he's not familiar with the constitution or or constitutional politics or how the constitution works and and you know and actually this brings me up to a good point if if, if you're if you're interested in kind of digging in a little bit deeper there's a a podcast i definitely recommend called what can trump teach us about con law and by con law i mean constitutional law and it's 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 led by a um, a constitutional law professor who goes into different um, precedents and Supreme Court cases and everything like that. And I, and I think you, you'll learn that Donald Trump really pushed the envelope when it came to the Constitution. He was going to push the norms all the way. And, and that's what Republicans wanted. That's what they signed up for. And that's what they got in Donald Trump. But I think what we often forget when we say things like, oh, I'm so tired of the Washington gridlock and everything like that. Our government was not meant to be efficient. It was not set up to be efficient. It was set up to be the opposite of efficient. Um, it's an inefficient setup. Uh, and it was done that way on purpose. Our government was not set up to be efficient. It was set up to invite compromise. And if you think about it, at every turn, there has to be compromise. Uh, Republicans have to work with Democrats. Uh, the House of Representatives has to compromise with the Senate, who they uh, Congress has to compromise with the president. There has to be compromise along the way. And the, and the purpose is this, and the reason why you want compromise is because you want those congressmen to go and congresswomen to go and sell uh, the latest legislation to their, their constituents. Um, if you push things through by executive order and unilateral action, you don't have Congress's back. You may have your party's back, but you need, you, if you're a Republican president, you need your, you need the Democrats out there saying, hey, we worked with the president, we came up with the best solution. Yeah, it's not, it's not everything that we wanted, but it is a good solution. You want their support in that, in that legislation because that makes you more popular and you cannot win an election without getting independence as well as picking off some people from the other side of the aisle. Thanks for tuning in to Politics in Plain English. My name is Justin Hibbard, and if you like what you heard, please subscribe. You can find Politics in Plain English on your favorite podcast provider. The video cast is on my YouTube channel, Justin R. Hibbard. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Hey, it's all the same handle, Justin R. Hibbard. And lastly, I'll try and do a podcast and a vodcast once each week. But I do a lot more writing throughout the week, and you can subscribe and get my latest article in your inbox at justinrhibbard.substack.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is Politics in Plain English, and my name is Justin Hibbard.